Hello folks, Felix here from University Düsseldorf, Germany. In this video series we are going to talk about open science in the field of neuroscience and psychology. The series consists of three parts. In the first part we are going to talk about the problems in conventional science and our motivation to engage with open science. In the second part we are going to talk about practical measures which we can take as individuals and as a community to make science open. For example, pre-registrations, using open software and non-profit journals. In the last part we are going to address some caveats of open science and take a more critical perspective. Part 1. Facing the problem. Do you believe that some people can sense the future? According to a controversial paper by Daryl Bem published in 2011, we all can, at least to some degree. In a series of nine experiments with a total sample size of more than 1,000 participants, he investigated the effects of stimuli on behavior in antecedent trials, that is, behavior before the participants were actually shown the stimuli. Strikingly, he found significant results for various of such retroactive effects, like retroactive priming or retroactive habituation. The study claims that events which still lie in the future can affect the present, because people are able to sense them. It seems that Daryl Bam showed that time flows in two directions. But how can that be? Hold your thought for a minute as you bear witness as brain imaging research gets slapped in the face with a dead fish. No joke. In 2009, Craig Bennett and colleagues presented a disruptive poster at the Human Brain Mapping Conference. In a truly outstanding study, they presented emotional pictures to a frozen salmon while scanning its tiny brain. Remarkably, when contrasting the bold signal between conditions, they found a significant activation cluster in the brain of a dead frozen salmon. Now, how can that be? Our intuition and knowledge of the world tells us that both studies draw ridiculous conclusions. At least for the Salmon poster, this was intentional, to show how contemporary scientific practice can be abused to promote false claims. However, in the following I will present you evidence that many scientists treat exactly the same treacherous path. Bad scientific practice walks among us. First, let's set the terrain. Problems can arise at virtually any step of the research process. Many study designs have insufficient rigor and statistical power to begin with. But even when the sample size is justified by a sound power analysis, scientists might peek into the data before reaching the predetermined number, which is problematic for classical statistical analysis. Analysis itself is usually largely unconstrained and there are several reasonable approaches and measures to consider. This is especially problematic when no reporting standards are in place. Scientists might report exploratory analyses as confirmatory, omit null results and replication attempts. And as the saying goes, an open door may tempt even a saint. While estimating the prevalence of questionable research practices is difficult due to social desirability effects, it is now well known that they are much more widespread than we would like. In an influential study by John and colleagues from 2012, more than 50% of scientists admitted to have collected more data after seeing that results were not significant and about 50% to have selectively reported studies that showed the desired results. More than 40% admitted to have excluded data after looking at the impact of doing so. And again, this is just a fraction of scientists openly admitting their behavior. Let's take a closer look at two prominent bad scientific practices. First, p-hacking. p-hacking means to collect or select data or analyses until non-significant results become significant. Interestingly, this creates artifacts in the distribution of p-values in published literature around the threshold of p equals 0.05. Abnormally more p-values slightly below than above the threshold are reported. On the bright side, we can use this phenomenon to estimate the prevalence of p-hacking in different disciplines. In comparison to other fields, psychology does not look particularly well. Do you believe in coincidence? Because the second bad scientific practice I want to look at today is impressively demonstrated by a scientist we already met, Daryl Bam. In a guide on how to report research results, he advises researchers to create a story around the results rather than to accurately report a priori hypotheses. This is widely referred to as harking, that is, hypothesizing after results are known. The problem here is that this confuses exploratory and confirmatory research and ultimately leads to less replicability of results. 
Beyond scientific malpractice, we should be aware of the limits of our statistical tools. Given a 10% rate of real effects, a statistical power of 80%, and a significance level of 5%, we still arrive at a false discovery rate of more than 30%. To make things worse, however, the typical study in neuroscience does not even come close to a power of 80%. Overall, replicability in psychological science is meager. In a collaborative effort of many scientists, a total of 100 psychological studies were submitted to replication. While 97% of the original studies reported significant results, only 36% of the replications did. Similarly, effect sizes for replications were systematically lower, sometimes even showing a reversed sign. Interestingly, original effect size was correlated more strongly with replication success than team characteristics, such as experience and expertise. Direct replications ideally use the same methods, materials and analyses as the original study. However, replicability is a low bar to evaluate research by, and being able to reproduce results given an analysis pipeline does not tell us much about the soundness of the analysis pipeline itself and the conclusions we draw often depend critically on the analysis pipeline. If you think, however, that there is usually one dominant analysis solution anyways, then you are on the same page as the participating researchers in the smash hit study by Botvinnik, Nieser and colleagues published in 2020. As it turned out, however, even for a single neuroimaging dataset and predefined hypotheses, analyses were surprisingly variable between researchers, and so were the reported results. This effect was systematically underestimated by the participants. Given all this evidence, it is a reasonable conclusion to not take anyone's word for granted. Hence, you might want to go and take a look at the data and analysis scripts of a given research paper yourself before you buy its conclusions. Fortunately, such supplemental material is usually available upon request from the authors. Or is it? In a field experiment published in 2012, Kraftchik and Rüben asked authors to provide supplemental materials for papers which explicitly offered this. Unfortunately, only about half of the authors actually provided the requested materials and both response and compliance frequency was dependent on the perceived status of the requester. Last, let's talk about money. It should be no secret that research is very expensive and must be paid for by private funders or the government, which ultimately are us, the taxpayers. Some of these costs are necessary and unavoidable, others are not. For example, an SPSS license costs around 100 euros per person per year, while we could also use free software like R or Python. But to add insult to injury, I present the academic publishing system. In order to read research articles that were funded by the university, the university library of the same university must either acquire a journal subscription from publishers like Elsevier, or the research group must pay directly to make the article open access. Both options amount to multiple thousands of euros, essentially spent on web hosting and a bit of marketing. Of course, academic editors and reviewers are usually not paid for their work. In summary, False research findings are published in respected academic journals and questionable research practices are widespread. But even proper statistical tests can lead to wrong conclusions. Many studies have an insufficient sample size and cannot be replicated, while materials to thoroughly evaluate them are often unavailable. Oh, and scientific software and publishing is incredibly expensive. Fortunately, there are things we can do about it, which is going to be the topic of the next video. Part 2 tackling the problem. What are your thoughts on the problems of conventional science? Can open science help? Please let me know in the comments. At this point I'd like to thank the great open science community on Twitter to provide me with helpful pointers and resources, especially the people you see here mentioned on the screen. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.